We are right now in in a, a major transition period where jobs will be replaced by machines and new jobs will be created, but it is a robotic underpinning which has some people scared. Uh, Bill Joy is in the piece. Peter Thiel is in the piece, who is, of course, the founder of Palantir and the co-founder of PayPal, another great technologist. He's not as worried about the uh, displacement of jobs as Bill Joy is, but he, too, understands the power of artificial intelligence and how it's impacting every industry from healthcare to retail to logistics to the military. And uh, the uses are are far and deep, and it is also uh, something that's happening on a global scale where America's allies, as well as competitors, are also adopting this new technology. That's Maria Bartiromo. You may recognize her as the anchor and global markets editor for Fox Business. Maria has been a journalist for 30 years, starting back in 1989 as a production assistant at CNN Business News. She has seen and reported on some of the world's most major events, which you will hear about in our discussion today. Maria has an upcoming special debuting on September 22nd, 2019, tied to how artificial intelligence is changing the face of business and the workplace. Her research for this special included traveling across the country for over the past year and interviewing the top tier CEOs leading the charge on this topic. In today's conversation, you will hear some of her findings and what CEOs are saying about the future of AI and technology. You will also hear Maria's advice on how we should prepare for what's to come, what assumptions she had at the beginning of this project that were proven wrong, what jobs will be most in demand in the future, and how AI might impact leaders. You know, it goes back to education in a lot of these scenarios. It's unbelievable to me that I think the United States right now, when it comes to high school and grammar school, is like number 33 or number 35. We are not teaching our young people how to thrive in a new era. We're just not. I don't know why. I don't know what the problem is. But China is way ahead of us when it comes to middle school and grammar school and what their students are learning. Yes, they are going to school six days a week. And yes, they're in school many more hours. We've got recess and we've got lunch and we've got summers off. They don't do any of that. But education is so important. And I think that today, given the changes that we're all expecting, one should want to arm themselves with as much information about this AI revolution as possible and as much information about jobs that will be needed around AI. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit my website at thefutureorganization.com. If you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses that explore these themes in more depth, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. Also, if you get a few seconds, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. It really helps the show and I personally appreciate it since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest today is Maria Bartiromo. She is a Fox Business Global Markets Editor and Anchor. Maria, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. So I understand you've been embarking on a pretty interesting project uh, over the past few weeks, months. But before we jump into that, um, maybe we can start with just background information about you and how did you get involved into this space? How did you become an anchor? Well, I've been a journalist uh, for 30 years. I started my career at CNN. Um, I was a production assistant. I worked at CNN Business News. 
1989. And from there, I went on air for CNBC. And I was a business reporter and an anchor woman beginning in 1993 until 2013. So I stayed at CNBC for 20 years, being the first person to broadcast from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, um, helped expand the brand internationally, build out the CNBC brand, and was able to have a lot of firsts um, and watched a number of cycles in our economy from really the beginning when I first started my career at CNBC in 1993, when the individual investor revolution was really just taking off, where investors felt that they could arm themselves with the right information and they could invest for themselves. And that spawned an entire industry, the discount brokerage industry, with companies like TD Ameritrade and and Schwab and and uh, E Trade soaring as individual investors wanted in on this um, stock market boom that was chase. From there, I um, watched the dot com boom while at CNBC, where we saw money moving into technology stocks in an unprecedented way. We were on the doorstep of a of a new era, the year two thousand. And in the 90s, I watched companies like Amazon and Google go public and enjoy incredible amount of investor support where we became really fixated on what was this move into a new era and a change in work, a change in the way we operated in our lives and our work. And that was the dot-com revolution. Uh, Of course, that created a lot of uh, bubbles where we were investing in companies that just had a dot com at the end of their name, even though it didn't pr- produce any revenue or, or earnings. And of course, that turned into the big dot com bust, which led to international uh, prospects and globalization, where one thing would happen in one part of the world and it would stoke uh, interest or sell offs in another part of the world. Globalization really taking hold with the dot com revolution. Um, across the world as well. So there we saw uh, globalization happen for several years, going into this euphoric period in the U.S. for housing. And I remember we were in around 2006 when you saw money moving into housing and this idea that home prices were going up for any number of reasons, but people just thought they were going to continue to go up. And in 2006, if you looked at any market, pick Phoenix, which is one market I I looked at a lot, Uh, the average home price was up 40% year over year. And it was really for no good reason. You basically saw expectations go from my house is worth more because there's great demand to my house is worth 40% more in price because um, it just is. And that's what happens. And of course, that was the case until it just didn't happen anymore. So we had an incredible housing boom, which turned into an incredible house bust where we saw um, Wall Street analysts come up with security plans and securitization plans to get a mortgage, which were based on on very faulty ideas. Uh, so we had a, a major bust in housing, and that led to the greatest financial uh, recession in a generation. And of course, given globalization, that took hold across the world, which led to uh, a lot of upset and job loss and and uh, people losing capital and the election of Barack Obama. And uh, from there, we uh, went into um, a new way to look at things with a new president. Our our uh, country became divided, which led to the election of Donald J. Trump. Uh, and here we are looking at yet another revolution that is upon us, and that is the uh, AI revolution, where it's going to change the way we work and the way we live. And once again, you're seeing signs that you saw in the dot-com boom uh, that indicate things are about to change in a big way and the corporate sector is about to adopt something very different. So the adoption of artificial intelligence is going to be soaring in the coming years by companies who recognize that if they don't have AI, they will be at a disadvantage. So I've been I've been lucky enough to have a front row seat in a number of a major turning points for our global economy, and I can talk a bit about that. But today I'm working on a one-hour special on Fox News about AI, and it is called uh, Artificial Intelligence, uh, the revolution happening to our work and our lives. And um, I identify a number of sectors that will be changing in a big way. 
and uh, where jobs will go away, but there will be new jobs that that are created. And I think that similar to the dot com boom, when people were worried about their own jobs because digitization was taking place and companies were looking to take their business online and that meant a disruption individuals, you're seeing a similar kind of disruption now and you definitely are seeing uh, expectations of displacement, machines, but you are definitely seeing that same adoption by corporations who know that they've got to adopt to a new technology and got to adapt to a changing economy. It's really amazing the different um, the milestones, the different things that you've seen over the course of your career. And so maybe after we're done talking about AI, we can take a look back and you can identify if there are any patterns or specific things that you've noticed from each one of these periods. But tell me a little bit about this big AI project. Uh, from what I was told, you were traveling across the country, you were meeting with a bunch of different executives and getting their perspectives and thoughts on the subject of AI. Oh, absolutely. I've been speaking with the leading technologists of the world. I've been working on this for about a year, actually. Wow. Um, and in the piece, uh, we've got people like Bill Joy, who was the former CEO of Sun Microsystems, uh, among other jobs. And back in the year 2000, Bill Joy wrote an article for Wired Magazine. And it was the cover piece. And the cover story was titled, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. And Bill Joy identified artificial I remember intelligence. That. I remember that yeah. article. That's right. And today he feels more than ever that uh, the future may not necessarily need humans at some point. So we are right now in in a, a major transition period where jobs will be uh, replaced by machines and new jobs will be created. But it is a robotic uh, it, it is a robotic underpinning which has some people scared. Uh, Bill Joy is in the piece. Peter Thiel is in the piece, who is, of course, the founder of Palantir and the co-founder of PayPal, another great technologist. He's not as worried about the uh, displacement of jobs as Bill Joy is, but he, too, understands the power of artificial intelligence and how it's impacting every industry from healthcare to retail to logistics to the military. And uh, the uses are are far and deep, and it is also uh, something that's happening on a global scale where America's allies as well as competitors are also adopting this new technology. I went to uh, several AI labs. IBM has a uh, network of 12 global labs. We went to its largest lab and spoke with the director of research there, Dario Gill, who's been working on um, a number of, of projects in terms of AI and getting ahead of AI, as well as the chairman and CEO of, of IBM, Gini Rometty. I spoke with um, Ford Motors chairman and CEO, Jim Hackett, as he invested in Argo, which is an autonomous vehicle company, took a ride in an autonomous vehicle to take a look at how AI is empowering that. And there's a lot of healthcare in the piece as well, because uh, AI is able to get ahead of disease. I went and spent time at MIT and spoke with the provost, Marty Schmidt, as well as the head of the AI and computer science uh, division, Ooh. Daniela Roos, who is leading students in terms of looking for jobs that, that people don't want and coming up with ideas uh, to replace those jobs with machines. For example, uh, maybe a person would rather not work in separating um, plastics from cardboard. It's a recycling job that could be done by a machine. It's a, it's, it's a less, uh, it's not a pleasant job. And so why not give that to a machine? So Daniela Roos, the professor at MIT, took us through jobs like that. Um, and then I spoke with Professor uh, Regina Barzilay, who is developing an AI program around breast cancer. She was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, five years ago, and she's fine today. But after her diagnosis, she realized that there were better ways to do this, to identify cancerous tumors. And she's getting ahead of disease by coming up with an AI program to identify uh, potential cancer five Five years before it actually shows up. So MIT was certainly uh, an important part of the story as well. In addition, we've got um, a number of other technologists who go through what they expect to be really a changing workplace environment and why it's important to understand what artificial intelligence is. And importantly, it's important to understand 
AI versus AGI because, you know, artificial intelligence is, is simply machine learning today. And that is inserting information into a machine, making that machine smarter and enable the machine to take on tasks that are routine. So what's happening right now and the latest software that is in place, uh, and it's it's largely happening across enterprise. These are not consumer um, allocations. This is really for the enterprise. But what's happening in the enterprise right now is um, artificial intelligence that is comprised of a software that is watching you work and remembering how you work, remembering do, memorizing your speech and being able to mimic your speech, memorizing um, whatever you're doing with large data sets. So there are a number of um, industries and jobs that require large, large data sets to do your job. So, so one, one of them, for example, just to choose one would be something like evaluating someone for a mortgage, you know, a mortgage broker. You've got to uh, evaluate what the eligibility is. And that requires basically just looking at data. Um, do you pay your bills often, you know, regularly? Are you on time with your payback? Are, are you uh, someone who, you know, there's all types of, of data that will indicate how eligible you are for a mortgage. And once you teach the machine how to do that, the machine can do, you know, we'll check off this and check off that. And it's very easy for a machine to pick up that specific task. Similar situation with uh, reading reading an MRI or reading uh, reading a radiology report. Once the machine understands what's important in terms of reading that report, the machine can take over that job and um, and, and and get that report to the next level, so that maybe a human takes it from there. But we know what the lines show, what the report shows based on the machine uh, looking at it and understanding what the borderline. Um, you know, aspects of it are so that they can weigh in on it. You know, so there there are a lot of jobs like that that require large data sets. Even trucker, if a trucker is driving from point to point and the machine knows the point to point, um, you're not necessarily going in lots of circles or making lots of turns, but if you're going from point to point, um, a machine can can take over driving the truck autonomously and dropping off goods from point to point. Now, today, there are new smart cities being built, and these smart cities are trying to encourage and acclimate into this new AI world, whereas, if you, you know, there's a city in Arabia right now called Neom. Uh, there are several cities in China where they're just being built today, and if you're just being built today, you can actually create a city where people stand on top, uh, like on a bridge, and that's where they walk, and vehicles are on the bottom, and it's all autonomous. So going forward, you can understand how autonomous vehicles could come into play much more so than they are, even or they're expected to today in 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 life um, when you have a different city, when you have a smart city. So today, some certain cities are building their cities to accommodate artificial intelligence. I pers personally do not think that art, uh, um, autonomous cars are going to be on the road anytime soon. But for those cities who are building fresh, new, smart cities, of course, they can accommodate and acclimate and, and, and build their cities any way they want. And in that case, then yes, autonomous vehicles are, are, are going to be there. So, so depending on the job that we're referring to, um, which data is being used, it can easily be done by a machine. And that's what I'm looking at in my piece. Um, I'm also looking at AI versus AGI because artificial intelligence is very different than artificial general intelligence. AI is pretty much what I just said. It, it is um, picking up routine tasks, working um, with large data sets. But artificial general intelligence is very different because today a machine can listen to your voice and copy your voice and um, come up with telemarketing based on the sound of your voice. And that's another job that will likely go away. And that's a telemarketer at a call center because speech recognition has become so sophisticated that um, people are increasingly wanting to use that at their companies. And by the way, it has an 86% um, uh, satisfaction rate. So, so speech recognition is so sophisticated and that's part of 
intelligence. So these machines can copy what we're doing and they can replicate some of our routine tasks that we do. But for the most part, they're not generally intelligent. I mean, it's a machine. It's a machine that you taught it to copy you. It's a machine that knows how to mimic certain um, tasks, but it's not intelligent in a general way. For example, it, it can't reason. It can't analyze. It doesn't have emotion. It can't say, oh, well, I used this task for X, Y, Z, so why don't I try this task for a, B, C. You know, it can't use one one task that it does for a whole nother industry. It doesn't have that intelligence. It's not the human brain. So with artificial general intelligence, that is the goal where you want to see a GI um, be able to do everything that a human does. And we are moving in that direction. Uh, we are inserting information and data to an extent, into a machine to enable that machine to ultimately become artificially general intelligent. And so AI and AGI is very different. And AGI is not expected to really take home and and, and be a big part of our lives for, I mean, anybody's guess, but it could be 10 years, it could be 50 years, it could be 100 years. So it's anyone's guess if it's your children who are living with AGI or your grandchildren, but it is moving in that direction, and that's the reason that people like Elon Musk are very concerned about um, about AGI because uh, he feels that it is going to create – well, first of all, it'll, it'll create haves and have-nots, um, but that's, that's the least of it. He says it could lead to World War III because um, countries will try to adopt AGI and one-up each other in terms of machine – and smarter and smarter, certainly smarter than humans. But this is where we're going, and this is why this is important to uh, really study and understand what it is we want our computers to be. Eric Schmidt is also in my AI piece, and Eric says that there's no doubt in his mind that ultimately we will all have quote-unquote assistants. So you'll have a, a teacher's assistant which will be a machine. You will have a doctor's assistant, a machine. Everyone will have assistants to help them do their work and live their lives. And um, one of the ways to do that is to have AI inserted into a computer to teach that computer all of the menial tasks that you want done. And so, um, you know, for example, in healthcare, artificial intelligence is such that it can read a million eyes and very quickly know which eyes are demanded. Um, it can get ahead of disease because of all of the data sets. You know, even the Watson computer that IBM has, it can take seconds to write off certain disease that might be prevalent. For example, once the computer has all of the information and the data sets there, it can scan all of that information in a very short period of time. And the reason is, is because machines are studying the way humans work, what they do with these routine tasks, but they're doing it on a massive basis. They are studying thousands, millions of people and scenarios and very quickly learning how those tasks play out. And so that's why AI is so powerful when it comes to things like healthcare and transportation and large data set required jobs. AGI, artificial general intelligence, is the next level. And it is a, a, a much smarter computer, a much faster computer. And it's a, they're using facial recognition in a, in a, in a very um, significant way that's impacting their people. So facial recognition is just one form of AI where the computer can identify faces. And if you remember just uh, recently, you had 2 million people hitting the streets of Hong Kong in China. And one of the things that they did was they knocked down the facial recognition tower. And the reason is, is because China uses facial recognition in a state-sponsored network uh, because it tracks its citizens. That's what it does. It's a communist country and it tracks its citizens. So the facial recognition tower in Hong Kong was not only tracking citizens, 
just because that's what it does, but it was also able to identify who exactly was at the protest and who exactly was there at the two million person uh, protest where Hong Kongers were protesting China and the government of China and its authoritarian rule. So they knocked down the facial recognition tower so that the Chinese government didn't know who was protesting uh, in, in, in something that was very much indicative of how people feel about facial recognition. I mean, San Francisco became the first city in America to ban the use of facial recognition. That's, that's where I live. I'm sorry? That's, that's where I am. I'm in the Bay Area. That's right. So you can't use facial recognition right now because it's banned. And the reason is, is because civil liberty groups were afraid uh, that governments would abuse it and use facial recognition to identify people wrongly. And so um, facial recognition is one of those one of those technologies as p- part of AI that has become very much uh, controversial. And so China is using AI very significantly and, Ch- and investing very significantly in artificial intelligence to the extent that some people believe that China is actually ahead of the United States when it comes to AI. And this is important because... AI is used in the military. And again, when you are using artificial intelligence, what you're doing is you're using a machine that has input of information about how to do things. And it's leading the machine to be able to make predictions and um, make decisions based on that data. So if like back to the mortgage broker story, if you have all the data about a person, how eligible they are to get a mortgage, you know all about that person And the machine is able to predict whether or not that person is eligible for a, a, you know, a a mortgage. And um, when it comes to AI in the military, there's worry and concern that those who have AI will be able to predict troop movements or be able to predict deployment of weaponry. And so if China is ahead of the United States and there's uh, a problem and the two become um, enemies or, or, or fighting country understand and be able to tap into another country's troop deployment and weaponry deployment is obviously, um, is obviously very dangerous. In addition, Eric Schmidt will say that AI will ultimately create haves and have nots. You know, earlier I talked about how Eric is talking about everyone having assistance. Well, you know, that costs money. So this also could lead to a situation where you have, um, a worse situation than we've ever seen in terms of haves and have nots where some people will be able to afford that computer assistant. Other people will not be able to afford doing things uh, with a machine learning AI um, robot because that robot can do things so much faster and quicker that that person who has the robot will have an edge over everybody else. So there are real implications of the people who have AI, of the companies that use AI and what it means for individuals and their jobs and their lives. What were your sort of assumptions or expectations before you started this piece? So you, you mentioned that you were doing this for around a year. So before you started it, did you have certain preconceived notions or ideas around what you were going to find versus what you actually discovered when you finished? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know about AGI, first of all. I didn't understand artificial general intelligence. So that was something that I just became educated on over the last year. I also knew a little about AI based on uh, commercial uses. For example, artificial intelligence is all around us. And it is, um, you know, Siri. It is in your phone. It is your Echo at home. You know, it is those home devices where you said, you know, Siri... Um, where is, you know, my podcast, you know, where am I going? Or, you know, Echo, play yoga music and um, the machine will do it because the machine has studied all, all music and they know, the machine knows what yoga music is and the machine knows where I have to go for my podcast because the information has been inserted. I understood that. I did not understand the level of robotics that, is happening today. And I did not understand the level of AI um, and its uses throughout as many industries. I didn't understand that AI um, was getting ahead of disease the way that it is. I, I know that 
for years, you know, doctors have talked about having a machine that could be helpful. And um, certain hospitals have um, have machines and robots walking around. I mean, if you go to the Cleveland Clinic right now, you've got um, robots that go to the dock, pick up healthcare equipment, um, very carefully put the equipment on on uh, a certain uh, machine, and um, they travel to where the healthcare equipment and the medical devices have to go. So it's a robot that is performing a transportation um, task, to picking up the medical devices at the dock, them in you know on wheels and, and de- delivering them to somewhere else. I knew that was going on. I, I was not aware of how smart AI had become where it can identify disease in a person's eyes. So in other words, I suppose that's probably where most people are. They, they, they haven't heard of AI. They understand maybe some high level stuff. But it sounds like um, what you discovered is we're actually far, uh, much farther ahead than most people realize. It's being used for and it can do far more things than most people are aware of. Oh, yes, absolutely. AI is uh, much more sophisticated than you know, and it is actually wiping out white collar jobs more than you know and faster than you think. You know, Kai Fu Lee is one of the lead people in my piece, and he is the former president of Google China. He's considered the oracle of AI. And he told me that he believes 40 percent of all jobs will disappear within a decade because, simply put, a machine can do it. And a machine can handle these tasks faster, more effective, um, and save companies money. It's very cost advantageous, and it just enables humans to do things that they want to do or things that they can do elsewhere on a creative level. So while you think that AI can be incredibly helpful, and it can, it can also be job killing. Why are the CEOs who are worried, why are they worried and the CEOs who aren't worried and they're optimistic, why are they so optimistic? Well, I think people who are worried are looking at AGI, like uh, Elon Musk, like Bill Joy, who knew this was coming and wrote in the year 2000, that article, The Future Doesn't Need Us, because they see that uh, technology replaced jobs over time and will continue to do so. But this specific technology, artificial intelligence, is doing so in such an effective way, it is alarming. And, you know, we've seen art imitate life over the years, you know, the Terminator movies and uh, other, you know, HAL 9000 in, in A Space Odyssey, all these movies that portray a machine that will go head to head against a human and try to kill a human. I mean, that's a drastic uh, portrayal from Hollywood. But there are some people who believe life will ultimately imitate art. And that is where Elon Musk is. The people who are not that worried are saying, well, you know what? This is not happening right now. Right now, what we're talking about is machine learning. Right now, what we're talking about is AI helping me do my job better, uh, helping me live my life better, like Siri, like Echo, uh, like my refrigerator, who's talking to my washing machine, who's talking to my car. You know, we are now talking about smart appliances all over our lives. And the machine is talking to to the machine. So, So if I leave and then I'm coming back to my home and I want all my doors unlocked and I want the air conditioner on and I want it to be cool when I walk in. Um, I've got AI in my home to speak to my air conditioner and then speak to my light switch to make sure that when I walk in my home, everything is ultra comfortable. And for me, that makes my life better and it makes it easier. So why wouldn't I want that? And that's what people like Peter Thiel and um, Eric Schmidt are looking at. But there's no doubt that these issues are creating a massive debate throughout business and and beyond, because right now, the most important conversation happening regarding AI is about ethics. And you're seeing an ethical conversation about this. I have Steve Schwarzman, the chairman and CEO of the Blackstone Group in the piece, and he just recently gave $350 million 
so that they could start through Steve Schwartzman um, School of Computing. And he did that because he said that we need a, a group of principles. We need a, a, a group of principles around ethics because he uh, compared AI to nuclear technology. He said it's like a nuclear bomb. When we first learned about nuclear technology, we didn't just start giving everybody nuclear bombs and say, oh, well, you know, this is really important technology. Here's a bomb for you. Here's a bomb for you. No, we had a conversation about the ethics of releasing nuclear technology. And there's a conversation taking place right now about the ethics of it. You know, Google recently pulled out of the um, of a contract with the Pentagon called Project Maven. Because Google employees, they had this contract with the Pentagon, and it was about AI, and artificial intelligence was fueling drones, which had cameras on them. So basically what it was, was AI was identifying what the images captured on the cameras from the drones were. And the employees at Google didn't want to work the, work on this because they said, well, we don't want the government to use our, I, our I, AI rather to identify individuals, especially if they're using it at the border, for example. Uh, you know, is the Pentagon using Google's AI at the border to identify uh, immigrants who are illegally crossing the border? Well, we don't want to be anywhere near that. And is the government using AI uh, to identify images um, in 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 uh, war wartime? And are they using it in the military to identify people to kill? We don't want to be anywhere near that. So Google pulled out of the contract with with the government, and it was a big controversy. But they, these and, and then and then by the way, Google had an ethical uh, an ethics committee that was disbanded. They had disagreements about what the ethics should be. But again, there isn't a set of principles around AI on a global basis. Because of that, you know, America has certain ethics. You know, for example, Palmer Lucky is one of the featured people in my piece. He's the CEO of Anduril Industries. This is a an AI military company. And he actually, Anduril Industries actually got the contract that Google walked away from. So Anduril Industries works with uh, the Pentagon and it, it has that Project Maven contract. And he says that, you know, China is also using AI in a very effective way, and they're trying to understand where the U.S.'s troop levels are. And they're right now uh, has has a goal to become the largest superpower in the world, militarily and economically. And uh, they are building the largest navy. They're building the fastest the, the navy at the fastest clip that anybody has ever seen. Um, and um, as a result of that. Um, People are nervous that the U.S. is not investing enough in this. That's why the White House recently had an AI and put together uh, a committee. There is a congressionally appointed committee in place that is looking at artificial intelligence as it relates to the military. Eric Schmidt is on that. There are members from um, Microsoft and Amazon on that committee as well because this conversation about ethics around AI is really heating up. I've interviewed um, a lot of people on the podcast, and I always ask them the same question around AI and, and technology and if they're optimistic or not. Um, and for a new book I'm working on, I interviewed 140 CEOs, and it was focused on leadership. But one of the questions that I asked them as well was around AI and the impact that it will have on work. And I found that a lot of the business leaders, either for the book or for the podcast, tend to be more optimistic. And they always say, you know, things will be okay. This isn't the first time we've seen this. Uh, we're not so worried about it. But then on the flip side, you also have a lot of people who are very worried about it. So I'm, after listening to you, part of me wonders if maybe even a lot of CEOs are just not aware of what's going on in the AI world. Because it sounds like what you discovered is that there's probably more, more threat, more things we should be worried about. Well, there definitely are threats, but you have to remember AI is being used to save money. Uh, if you can get a machine to do something quicker and faster and more effectively than a human, you're going to do that because it will save you money and it will cut costs at your company. A number of CEOs are looking at AI that way and they're seeing it as a positive, not recognizing that or not focusing on the impact to 
individuals who may not be ready for this, don't have the skill sets to uh, survive or thrive in, in this new economy. So I think we're at a point in time right now where companies are just beginning to adopt and adapt. And, um, you know, there are a number of reports that I have from IBM and from PricewaterhouseCoopers who say that uh, corporate adoption of AI is about to soar. When you look at the number of companies being funded right now, um, I think the venture capital industry has plowed record numbers, more than $9 billion into AI startups. Um, and you've got about 2,000 companies right now who have AI as their core business model. And so we're just beginning to see AI as a huge source of investment and um, as, as, a, as an opportunity. So businesses and CEOs are probably looking at it and trying to understand how they should adopt it, how they need to adapt to get it in there, get it in their companies so that it can save them money. And that's what they're thinking about right now. And it will save them money because obviously putting a computer in place of a human to do menial tasks or to do routine tasks will save money. And so it's supposed to add $16 trillion globe P in the next decade. Uh, that's the kind of productivity gains that we're going to see as a result of AI. And remember, when it comes to the military, you know, there are jobs that are better for a computer. You know, if you have a, a soldier running into a building where you don't know the threat, let's have the computer run in there. Let's have the robot run into the building where we're not sure if it's going to explode. There are certain, there are certain jobs that are definitely better poised for a robot. And CEOs know that. And they also know that this is going to mean cost savings. But I don't know that anybody has a clear idea of what the next 10, 20, 30, 100 years looks like as computers get smarter and smarter and more uh, and more adept at, at doing human tasks. And, you know, AGI is something altogether different because right now these machines, Machines, while they do these menial tasks, they can come up with, you know, eligibility for a mortgage and, 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 you know, go point to point with goods and tell you they're going to put on your yoga music. They're, they're not generally intelligent. They're not intelligent like the human brain. They, they can't reason. They can't analyze. They can't um, use, you know, one idea and, 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 and apply it to another idea. So humans and the human brain is still incredibly sophisticated in terms of those things. But one has to wonder, as computers get smarter and smarter and smarter, what happens when they can reason and can analyze and, and, and can solve problems like the human brain can. It's a little, a little freaky to think about. A little... <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it really is. Well, that actually brings me to my next question. I mean, from a lot of the things that you saw, did anything freak you out or scare you or just really make you worried about the future? Well, you know, I'm not expecting the robot to turn on a human and try to kill the human. This is what Hollywood has been writing about for four years. So, no, um, I, I do think that the broad public doesn't understand the threat of more sophisticated and better and better robots. Because, you know, if you look at China right now, there are simulations of people on television. There are, you know, anchor women like myself who are on TV reading the news until you look closer. It's actually simulated. It's not a human. It's a, it's a computer. Um, and when you recognize what can be done, then you start questioning, well, can I believe that? Did somebody put in the algorithm certain news that they want me to know? Did somebody put the information in the computer for their own interest and their own agenda? And so the idea of journalism and the idea of seeking truth, well, I don't know what happens when man is moving the machine 
and the machine suddenly can move itself. It's an unknown. So sure, from that standpoint, I got scared, but I didn't, I didn't get scared the way Elon Musk appears to be scared. Um, but Elon Musk has been sounding the alarm on this for a lot of years. And I understand the premise that computers are getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and that has implications. Whether or not that computer turns on us, um, it, it remains to be seen, frankly. I don't know. What do you expect, based on what you learned, what you found from doing this uh, year-long research project, what do you think will happen to jobs in the coming years? So let, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years out. What, what do you think we'll see? Are there any industries, for example, that you think will be most impacted or jobs or careers? Uh, will the work week change? Yeah. Well, right now, I mean, this is today in 2019, we have more job openings than we have people. I mean, the labor, the labor force is so tight right now with a 51-year low in unemployment and, and jobs are plentiful. I think that will only get worse, whereas there won't be enough people for the jobs that we need. And the jobs that we have will be able to be filled by computers. So I think longer term, you are going to see a massive displacement in work and in jobs. And I think the most important thing that people have to do is, first of all, recognize that machines are getting smarter and smarter and they will take your job. And you need to make sure to arm yourself with the right information and an education where you are savvy with technology. Because if you're not savvy with technology in the next 10 years, you will be left out. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a coal worker. What do I know about coding? And I'm a truck driver. And what do I know about engineering? Well, you're right. You don't know anything about it. You better learn. You better start understanding that technology is changing the way we live and changing the way we work. And individuals need to understand what's driving it because jobs will go away. Now, the upside here that we haven't spoken about yet is the fact that new industries and new technologies create new jobs. And so back in the dot-com boom, when we were talking about, you know, Pets.com and, you know, Joe Schmo's Pizza Place.com. Everybody was putting a dot com at the end of their name. Um, people started to worry about what the digital world meant for them. And, you know, there was about, well, my job is going away because my, my company is taking everything online. Well, yes, that's true. But we didn't understand the jobs that were coming. So today we have coding and we have um, engineers and we have people who mine data and organize data. And, you know, we, we had no idea that those jobs existed back then. So I do think that in this environment where we're seeing technology become so sophisticated that will create new jobs for humans to uh, work on this kind of technology. But that's why educating yourself is so important. You have to be uh, comfortable with this kind of disruption and comfortable with understanding where this is going so that you can get one of those jobs of the future. What responsibility do you think companies have, uh, especially when it comes to reskilling and upskilling? I had a Accenture executive on the podcast a little while ago, and she was telling me the story of how Accenture automated 17,000 jobs in finance but the jobs that they automated, these were all uh, number crunchers, people who were just uh, adding, calculating data. And what they did is they upskilled these 17,000 employees to be more like strategic advisors to their clients. And I've actually heard quite a few stories like that. Uh, I had an executive from McDonald's on here, same thing. He said that they're implementing a lot of kiosks in their stores, but instead of decreasing the headcount of the restaurant workers, they're leaving it the same and in some cases in some cases increasing it to focus more on the customer experience you know bringing you your food ask you how your day is going so what responsibility do companies have and do you see uh, any positive things coming out of that oh yeah absolutely and and one of the positives i just mentioned and that is the jobs that we don't know new jobs will be created but you know i, I think what what you've just defined is happening all across the country where managers are seeing an opportunity to cut costs and they're using technology to replace certain things. I mean, there is Flippy the Burger Flipper right, right now in McDonald's, in, in, you know, in 
in, in test uh, stores where you've got a, you've got the machine, the robot flipping burgers. I, I think that there's an enormous responsibility on the part of business managers and CEOs to unleash AI, as I mentioned earlier, in an ethical way. And that's why this question around ethics is so critical. Um, look, I, I think that there will be other jobs. And what you've just defined tells me that there are jobs that are creative and there are jobs that are um, you know that, that you that you require a personality to interact with with customers services that will not be handled by a robot can't be handled by a robot right now but when you think about those jobs are those jobs going to command high wages probably not um, th- this is going to level a lot of wages because if you have the in terms of machine learning, maybe you'll command a higher wage. But if your job is going to be replaced with a robot and then you're going to be put into another area where you can do things more creative and talk to customers, maybe the salary doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't keep up to that kind of job. So there's there's that to think about. Where are the high paying jobs? How do certain certain industries keep high paying jobs when you've got machines doing it for so much lower uh, numbers? And and so these are also questions that are being discussed right now in the corporate suite in terms of unleashing artificial intelligence in the workplace. I've also heard stories and I don't know if you've encountered this um, during your travels and discussions around how AI and technology specifically might impact leaders and even getting rid of leaders inside of companies because AI will be able to do a lot of the decision-making stuff for them. Did you hear any stories or come across those discussions at all? Well, I think that the first level of jobs that will be impacted will be white-collar jobs. You know, oftentimes we talk about the blue-collar worker getting getting the shaft. Here, it's white-collar. And Kai Fu Li, who is you know running this firm Sinoventions, it's a, he, he he is acquiring AI companies right now in his private equity firm and venture capital, so that he can identify jobs that are done better by computers and can save money. And so I think that as you're if you're a CEO, you're always looking for ideas in terms of cost advantages, and implementing AI is one of those. Someone has to lead the organization, of course, but artificial intelligence is basically machine learning so that the machine can make predictions. And that's what, you know, that's one role of a leader making predictions about where the leader may have his his or her assistant to help make those decisions. Or, you know, I, I don't know what a company looks like down the road if it's largely electronic and largely machine learning. Uh, including the including the leader, I don't know, but but I do think that um, making predictions is one of the key advantages and reasons that people want AI in their infrastructure. Yep, yeah, I hear that a lot as well. Um, you know, there's also a lot of talk around what will happen to the work week. And I suppose this is maybe a little bit more on the utopian side. A lot of people say we're going to have abundance. We're going to work, uh, you know, 10, 20 hours a week. We're going to have universal basic income. We're only going to be doing the things that we love. From your research, do you find that that vision is, I mean, is that realistic? Or are we going to get to a point where everyone is just kind of, you know, hanging out? We got money coming in from the government. We're just doing stuff that we love. Or is that maybe a little bit too rosy of a picture. Well, no, I mean, I think that, you know, if you've got digital automation um, displacing, you know, middle skill workers and performing routine tasks like sales and, and, and office and administrative support, production, repair occupations, um, these middle skill occupations uh, accounted for a third of employment um, in, in 1970. And by 2016, it had fallen to less than a quarter, 23% of employment. So to be clear, machines took over those jobs and the individuals 
did other things and doing other things may very well mean you're changing your schedule. I mean, we're very used to the work week being what it is five days a week, eight to eight, eight hours a day. But you, the whole point of AI is to do things faster, to do things more effectively, enabling the individual to do other things and uh, use their time for more creative aspects of the job. So it, it will be, it will be, um, sort of disruptive for individuals to change the way they approach their work. Eventually, hopefully people will get comfortable with the idea, well, oh, I'm not doing that. It's a, it's a routine task, but I'm in a much more creative position. Because as I said earlier, right now, AI is not generally intelligent. They can't reason. They can't solve problems. They can't um, you know, do things that the human brain can do. But there's no reason that I would say um, there's no reason to believe that the work week is not going to change dramatically. Very cool. That's good to know. Um, you have been around for a lot of uh, very uh, historic events and milestones, reporting on the stock exchange, uh, the dot-com boom and bust. Do you see any patterns between all these historic events versus where we are now with this whole AI discussion? Like, are you looking at it and saying, oh, man, this looks just like dot com. This looks just like what happened 20 years ago. Or is this just totally new, unique, never seen it? Oh, no, this is this is the evolution that that we've been watching take place for a long time. It's just AI is deepening that, you know, jo jobs have been replaced for a long time by technology. And it's been a good thing because it's made our lives better and it's made uh, us do things differently. I mean, when I first started broadcasting on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in um, in 1991, I was at CNN, and then in 93, I went to CNBC, also at the Stock Exchange. The exchange was five rooms, uh, five different rooms, um, and it held about 5,000 people. So wow. there were 5,000 people distributed around five rooms. And, you know, this was when trading was very much done largely on the trading floor, whereas the New York Stock Exchange was this very crowded place with people running around, getting their trades in. Um, today, it's one room and it's under 100 people. And the reason is, is because trading has gone electronic. And when you want to make a trade and invest in things, you can do it much easier and much faster by just inserting it into the computer and getting your trade done. Whereas in the past, when I first started, there were individuals walking directly to the post, the trading post, telling the specialist, I want to buy 100 shares of IBM, I want to sell 100 shares of GM, and an individual was executing that trade. That's no longer the case. And so that was you know, one early indication of how technology was about to replace jobs. I mean, the New York Stock Exchange is, is a prime example of how technology – has replaced humans on the trading floor, you know, and that's just one white collar job. Remember, these are high paying jobs. These are white collar positions. That's why I think people, that's one thing that I think people don't realize that it's not, you know, the low paying, low skilled jobs that are going to go away as a result of AI. No, it's the high paying jobs. It's the white collar jobs that are being displaced. That's, that's what I think people don't understand. Do you have a sense of what jobs will be in demand? Uh, I know there have been some studies and reports that have been uh, put out over the past few years, but if there's one particular area or segment or job career that you're very um, excited about that you think will do well over the coming years with this AI revolution, where, where would you put your money? Well, I think healthcare. I think healthcare is an, is an area where AI is only going to make better. So, you know, whether it's cancer or Parkinson's, there is a real study going on in terms of getting ahead of disease and understanding where tumors are and understanding how a tumor develops uh, as it relates to cancer. There is massive study going on right now about the brain and why Parkinson's happens and why autism and, and uh, Alzheimer's become, um, you know, kill it, have, have, have killed our people. And we don't have answers yet. We don't have enough information on the brain to fully understand 
why these disease kill uh, these disease kill us. And so I think with AI, the more machine learning and the more study that's going on, this will be an uh, this will be a compliment to a doctor. Now that doesn't mean that some doctors will lose their jobs. You know, reading a radiology report will be easier by a machine. But I think generally speaking, people want the bedside manner of a physician, of a human. So while the doctor will be much better off with more and more tools to help us in our health care, the doctor, your prime doctor, is probably not going away so soon. And so health care and nurses and those people who have that bedside manner, that creativity, that emotion, we all need certainly when we're sick, that bedside manner is critical. That's going to be a job that will be in demand. And there will be other jobs within healthcare that will be in demand. And I think healthcare is one area that's going to have a great benefit from, from AI. You know, there are also certain logistics, manufacturing, that jobs will go away, but there will be other jobs that will come from that. Um, you know, I don't know what they'll be called, but just like coding and engineering and mining data came out of the digitization revolution, other jobs will come out of the AI revolution. Um, but when you look at healthcare, transportation, financial services, where big data sets are used, these are the industries that will be most impacted by AI. I know we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe one more question for you. And it is, what do we do? Um, so we have thousands of people who tune in to listen to the podcast. They're all probably thinking about, you know, what does this mean for me? Uh, do you have any advice for what we should do as individuals for our careers, our jobs, our, our companies to, to prepare for or think about this new world that we're going to be a part of? Well, first I would say to everyone, life is short. So make sure you enjoy every day and cherish it because it moves fast and it goes by fast in the blink of an eye. And I think when you think about some of the big ticket items that are happening like AI right now in this transformation of work, I think you, 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 know, you, you remember how precious life really is and how short it is. So I think it's really important for people to recognize that life is so short and cherish the ones that you love and cherish the things in your life that you love. Do that immediately. Tell your mom you love her today. Um, secondly, I think that when you have jobs that are going to be replaced by machines, you really have to understand why and what that machine is going to do. Understand what the technology is and with education. You know, it goes back to education in a lot of these scenarios. It's unbelievable to me that I think the United States right now, when it comes to high school and grammar school, is like number 33 or number 35. We are not teaching our young people how to thrive in a new era. We're just not. I don't know why. I, I don't know what the problem is. But China is way ahead of us when it comes to middle school and grammar school and what their students are learning. Yes, they are going to school six days a week. And yes, they are work, they're in school many more hours. We've got recess and we've got lunch and we've got summers off. They don't do any of that. Um, but education is so important. And I think that today, given the changes that we're all expecting, one should want to arm themselves with as much information about this AI revolution as possible and as much information about jobs that will be needed around AI. And that goes back to education. Educating us on all of this is going to be critical. I love that advice. Um, well, I just had a couple of rapid fire questions, just fun questions, just so people can get to know you a little bit better as a person. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. So first one was, or is, what is your greatest business failure? My greatest business failure. Wow. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, if you know, you can I've think been, of one. yeah, I've, I've done, I've done very well in my career. Um, I work really hard and I, and probably if, if, if there's anything, I probably need to take my own advice that I gave everybody a few minutes ago and cherish our lives and cherish my own life and maybe, you know, um, not take it all so seriously yeah. <laughs> because I do take it all so seriously and I work so hard. And I think sometimes you forget to take 
some time to yourself and, and vacation. And I, and I, and I mean, I don't know that it's, I, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to call it a failure, but yeah, I understand. It's definitely something that balance. What has been your most embarrassing moment? Um, well, when I was a girl, I got fired. <laughs> I was uh, working at Kleinfeld's uh, department store as a girl, um, and I was the stock girl. And um, my job was to go into the rooms where the brides tried on their dresses after they were done and take all the dresses back to the stock room. And these dresses were really heavy um, and, the, and the veils. But before I would take them back, I would try on all the dresses. Oh. And I remember my <laughs> boss caught me. Um, after she caught me the third time, she simply said, Maria, go home. You don't want this job. Oh, and so it was that. a very valuable lesson when I was a very young girl about um, about life, and that is do your job. I love that story. Uh, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of uh, being able to help, help democratize investing and democratize uh, business for individuals. You know, when I was at CNBC, I broke open the morning call. I don't know if you remember, but back in the nineties, uh, investment research was really hard to come by and it was expensive and big investors would pay for big research. Um, and by the time the individual got around to seeing the research, like Goldman Sachs says, buy IBM because of X, Y, Z reasons. By the time an individual got their hands on that kind of research, the stock had already moved. But I made it my business to get into work every day and call all of my sources on Wall Street, every trading desk, to find out what they were selling, what they were telling their big clients who paid big money for it, and go on the air with it. So I basically broke open that morning call, and I'm really proud of that because I, it helped democratize investing. The same thing as being the first person to broadcast from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I was able to help democratize investing, and I'm, and I'm proud of that. So I guess my, my biggest... What I'm proud of in my career is that I've I've had a career of of helping individuals and being on the side of the investor and the individual to help them. What's your favorite business or non-business book? Well, I, I've read a lot uh, of Churchill um, and I love uh, reading about our founding fathers. So um I've got that, but but right now I'm reading um, I'm, I'm reading a great book called um, Strength in Stillness, and it's a, it's by a, a guy named Bob Roth, and it's about the mind and meditating and being still, and knowing that if you stop and you are still and you think about it and you recognize that sometimes your world is like an ocean where you've got the waves going crazy all around you and the waves are slamming down, but you look further out and you see that the sea is really calm in certain areas and still. And if you get to that place, you actually can do your job and, and live your life better because your mind is at peace. And so I'm really enjoying this book, Strength and Stillness, right now. And last two questions for you. Who's the best mentor you've ever had? My mother. My mother has always <laughs> been my, my greatest mentor. Um, and she worked incredibly hard her whole life. She's always did the right thing. She has incredible integrity and she taught me so much. So for me, my, my greatest influence and mentor was my mother and is my mother. If you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? Well, in retrospect, I would have liked to start my own business. Um, I definitely am creative in terms of coming up with new ideas and how to do things. And I, and I would have liked to, I think, do that. But I also, um, I also have lots of hobbies that I like to do. And I, and I thought at one point I would become an interior decorator. I love to decorate. I do that as um, a hobby. So I might, I might be decorating. <laughs> hey, that's always fun and relaxing. Um, where can yes. people go to learn more about you? Uh, I know you are pretty much everywhere, but if there's anything specific that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm live, um, every weekday on Fox business on a program called mornings with Maria. It is uh, daily Monday through Friday from 6am to 9am. 
And I've got a weekend program called Maria Bartiromo's Wall Street, also on Fox Business, that it airs on the weekends on Fox Business. And I've got a weekend program on Fox News called Sunday Morning Futures on Fox News Channel. And that's on Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, I've got um, Twitter and Instagram and Bartiromo.com uh, is my website. And um, I certainly am working at Fox Business and, and coming up with this special um, the special will air on September 22nd on Fox News Channel, um, and it will repeat on Fox Business, and it will also be living on Fox Nation on uh, Fox News. Well, I'm I'm very, very excited to see it, and thanks for uh, coming on to be a guest and sharing some of these really interesting insights and things that you found from your year-long project. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. My guest, again, has been Maria Bartiromo. Make sure to check out her program when it goes live. And, of course, you can find her all over social media. I will see all of you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Future of Work podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please do me a favor and rate and review the show on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast platform is. And remember, if you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses based on some of the themes that I explore in this show, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. If you're interested in being added to my newsletter, you can do that by visiting thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. And you can also get in touch with me directly if you have any inquiries for podcast sponsorships, working with me or having me keynote your next event. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. I will see you next week.